Okay, this is the uh, final recording of uh, Chapter 4 material on sequencing, and so let's get started. So, where we're at is putting the reeds together. So, this is the process called assembly. And I wanted to take a little bit of an historical approach. Uh, the So, you know, long time ago in a land far away, there was no such thing as the Human Genome Project. And so, of course, that came up about as a political uh, uh, process and sort of it's kind of interesting to go through this. Uh, um, uh, Watson of Watson and James, Watson of Watson and Crick fame uh, was largely responsible for uh, convincing uh, Congress and the White House and whatnot that it would be a good idea to go ahead and sequence, to generate a reference sequence for the human genome. And so uh, over a long period of time, the planning for that involved what we're going to now kind of look back on and say was the governmental approach. And so this was combining efforts from a number of universities and then uh, Department of Energy, of all things, and National Institute of Health, of course. And so the approach that they came up with was the idea that, you know, look, um, we're going to need to in do a lot of investment in this. We need to build machineries that doesn't exist, but we're also, uh, you know, it's not like we haven't done anything in the past. And so what we do have at the moment, this being in the, in the late 80s, we have landmarks. We have markers for a number of genes and other DNA elements in the genome. We already know where they go. We know where the insulin gene goes. We know where et cetera, et cetera, right? And so the approach that they suggested is that, you know, given that the technology for reading DNA base pair by base pair is limited, we can only do uh, uh, hundreds to maybe a thousand base pairs at a time. And so we're going to have to, you know, in effect, blow up the genome and then sequence those fragments and then put those fragments together generate a library in which the fragments that you're going to sequence, you already know the general location in the genome. So this is called the hierarchical genome approach. The shotgun is the idea that you're going to use a, a biochemical process to basically chop up the genome into, say, 10,000 base pair fragments, and then you're going to collect those, and then you look through those for markers that you recognize the ones that you know, well, now you have some general idea, whether it goes to chromosome 1, 2, 3, etc. So you clone those fragments, and you exclude the other fragments because you don't know where they go. And so an interesting sideline along this, you know, so this involved, you know, talking with a number of people across academia and whatnot, but not everybody was included. And so a name that you should know is Craig Ventner. Um, he, he formed a corporation called Solera, and I kind of make the joke that, you know, he wasn't included. He, he was certainly an expert on this, but he wasn't sort of part of the team, and so for a variety of reasons, he wasn't included in this huge sequencing project. So he, in effect, said, all right, I'll do it myself, and so he convinced venture capitalists and also pharmaceutical companies to back his approach, which we'll call the whole genome shotgun approach. So the downside of the, of the landmark approach is that it, you have to sort through an awful lot of DNA to find the markers. And so Craig's approach was basically to skip trying to find where the things were, just go ahead and sequence it. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use computers and algorithms to take all of those fragments and we're going to figure out how to put them back together in the in the genome just simply by looking at the sequences and using uh, assembly algorithms okay and so um, it's sort of of <laughs> interest uh, historically about these two different approaches because certainly pharmaceutical money and venture capitalist money drove improvements and and competition, if you will, with the government approach, we may still be 
waiting for the genome if it was up to the government approach. But in the end result, here's the benefit of the government approach. We would have had a finished human genome as opposed to the whole genome shotgun approach, which couldn't even begin to assemble the whole genome. And you should know why. Without the landmarks, there's lots and lots of repetitive DNA, and so landmarks give you a hope of piecing together, even though you have repetitive DNA, you have the chance of piecing them together to the correct location in the genome. If you have repeats over and over again, this whole genome approach is not going to get you a unique genome assembly. You can't locate repeats uniquely to the different chromosomes. So this was this the whole genome shotgun approach was never going to get you a whole genome, but it certainly pushed and made things much quicker. Okay, so there are some similarities to the approaches. Um, you know, basically, again, you start by, you're going to chop up the genome into small fragments, and you're looking for overlapping fragments. You're going to clone the fragments so that you have lots of material to work with. And this, the actual sequencing part means that you sequence these fragments, and then you assemble those fragments into what you're called a contigs. Now, the, the government approach then takes advantage of when you have landmarks, you would be able to identify those landmarks. And so as you're building those fragments to larger and larger contiguous fragments, you'll have some sense of where they belong in the genome. Okay, so again, given the genome contains VNTR signs, etc. So those are examples of repetitive sequences. And these are scattered throughout the genome. They're the same DNA element. They have the same words. So therefore, you can't uniquely identify them. So again, random fragments is not enough. So what do we mean by non-random fragments? We mean landmarks. Okay. So nowadays, though, here's the deal. The, the whole genome shotgun approach is not going to work if you don't have landmarks and substantial mapping already done. But now that there is a human reference, it's rather straightforward. We can sequence... Um, individuals, other humans, and then because we have a reference, what sequences we have, we can, in fact, throw back into the database to see where they hit. Okay, so in more detail, this is the, the, the hierarchical genome shotgun approach. So the idea would be to sort of map first, sequence later, right? So the mapping first is identify the landmarks. The landmarks allow you to take those fragments and put them back into the genome. The goal then was to sort of minimize the size of the genome library. And, and so there became kind of this target idea of the golden tiling path. The idea is that each fragment would contain just enough information on the ends so that you can link adjacent fragments into contiguous segments. And the idea is that you can sort of get fragments that are a certain size and sort of walk across the genome one after the other. And so this is called the golden tiling path. Okay. Uh, shotgun sequencing, what do you do? You take your, your library fragments and you, you break up that fragment and sequence the fragments. And then you merge those sequences by routinely going back and sequencing from your library, okay? This is a nice way that this last paragraph here says, but it requires additional preliminary work. I hope you appreciate that this would be an enormous task to sort through all the DNA fragments and identify markers first. It would be like analogously to, you're given a list of cities throughout the world but you're not given any geolocation information. And so you're basically having to sort of sort through and place those cities onto a blank map. And so while you can kind of, you know, locate cities to a, uh, to a map, you're not going to do it precisely. And so um, it's going to be quite a bit of work to sort of work them into shape just based on, you know, the landmarks alone. Okay, so Ventner's approach was the idea as you chop the... DNA into random reads. 
and then assemble those random reads. And so their library uh, meant that they had, they did sequencing on over 27 million fragments and then tried to assemble those reads into contigs and grow and grow and grow. Okay, so the advantage clearly, well, you, you skip all the, work, the landmark work, right? The d disadvantage is that if the sequence is in effect random, if there aren't repeat elements, if there isn't structure, okay, you'll never be able to assemble all of those independent reads uniquely in a way that would be, we know we have the genome sequence. Okay, so part of the next uh, series of topics is we're going to kind of take you through the, the approach of taking sequence reads and building contigs. Okay, and the idea is that you look for overlapping regions that are the same, so they have a consensus sequence. Okay, it's bottom up in the sense that if you don't have any landmarks, okay, you're just taking fragments from all over the place and trying to assemble them afresh. Uh, top down would be the other way, is that you already know where the fragments come from, and so therefore you're just extending down to the level of base pair reads. Okay, so advantages, disadvantages, so the uh, whole genome shotgun approach, the idea is that you can work with very short reads and using computer power you can assemble them, and so it's much, much faster and cheaper uh, in principle compared to, you know, setting up all of that landmark identification. But there's no question that the limitations, the disadvantages are significant. In the end, the whole genome shotgun approach cannot assemble a genome unless you have additional information. So the idea here then is that de novo, so when you're taking a, a, a genome from a species in which you have very little genetic information, this would be a poor choice if the genome is complicated, meaning it has lots of different DNA elements and lots of DNA elements that are the same. That's going to be a difficult genome to tackle with the whole genome shotgun approach. All of these approaches, remember, uh, you're making a library first, okay? And so it's the different approaches then talk about what's in the library. So you're always going to be breaking up the genome into smaller uh, chunks of DNA. Um, and again, that's because the sequencing fragment is about a thousand base pairs. Um, we introduced, in the last time we talked, we introduced some new technology that has extended those reads you know, you know, potentially into the, uh, the low millions. So you can read a DNA molecule that's you know, one to two million base pairs long in principle that can be read by some of the next gen sequencing technologies. Okay, so obviously then that would make assembling those fragments much easier. The longer the fragment, the easier the process of putting the puzzle together. 1,000 base pair limit. Please work on that. Make yourself a lot of money, right? <laughs> okay. So let's talk about assembly when you don't really have any landmark information to work with. So, okay. So the basic idea is that you're going to have a collection of reads, right? You take your library and you grab the fragment from that and you throw it into your sequencer and you generate reads. A's, T's, G's, and C's. Then the, the computers then take over, so grabbing the, the reads from the, uh, uh, the database from the instrument, and so then you begin the process of assembly, which is that you take each one of the reads and you look for regions that overlap, meaning sequences in common, and you start growing a continuous sequence, right? And so you then will have a collection of, say, contigs, meaning that you grab parts of several reads and that belongs to one read or one segment and another collection of reads that's a different area. And so you will then try to look for regions of overlap and assemble contig one, contig three, contig two. And so once you have that, you are doing what you're called scaffolding. You're building contigs into a continuous sequence. And then you now have these larger 
chunks of red DNA that you believe belong together from those tiny reeds, you continue the assembly process and so you grow and grow and grow by in effect trying to link the scaffolds and then eventually <laughs> gap fill remember okay so you're going to have chunks of repetitive DNA that you can't really resolve so you're going to then try to use that what you do have to map back to the chromosome okay so again the the key thing here and I'll have an exercise for you to to take uh, the uh, a, a, a blown up sentence from from well this is from uh, Shakespeare and see if you can assemble it into its original form and so the key to assembly if I haven't driven this point home it's that you need to have overlapping sequence read one read two you can't put them together unless read one and read two share some sequence in common so all right so we got DS Romans count NS countrymen Lee friends so how do we put this together so we're gonna look for regions of overlap so DS well that comes from this one right so DS DS and then Romans Rome okay and okay well that's gonna come from okay there's lend tree men okay that's gonna come from country men okay so let's see what we can do we can start putting these things together so for, so if we grab them into overlaps so let's go back so a fragment was this DS Romans okay so we can friends Rome okay so once we overlap them arrange by overlap we can see it's clearly friends Romans countrymen lend me your ears right so Shakespeare and uh, Julius Caesar all right there we go so overlaps lead to consensus okay so look for that uh, exercise I'll, we'll make it probably as a bonus problem for you and we'll make it a group effort as well and uh, I'll give you a much larger uh, text to work from and see how you do okay so let's emphasize then what are the problems of the human genome has lots of repetitive sequences and so this is one of the take-home messages for you when you say what's in the genome and if you say genes it's like well you're technically correct but if I ask you you know what's the most numerous type of DNA element in your genome and if you say genes you're not even close to being right okay so transposons a type of repetitive element are by far the most numerous DNA elements in your genome representing I think something like 44 percent total if you add up all of the repetitive sequences well over 50 percent of your genome so 3.3 billion base pairs half of those base pairs are found in repetitive sequences and only some of those are of course going to be functional but that's another story okay so we just gave you a pretty easy problem to work with so let's give you another one so it's like stand ho stand ho speak the word along stand 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 so these are spoken by different people right but stand shows up one two three four five times so and it includes an exclamation point one two three times so you can appreciate that a, f uh, a paragraph like this is going to be really challenging how can I possibly say that this stand belongs to the second soldier and not to the first soldier so the idea then is we can start fiddling around with our our material and that will help us deal with repetitive sequences and one of them is again if you can get longer fragments so longer sequence reads that will go a long way to helping resolve repetitive sequences another approach and I'll mention just briefly is the idea that you read both ends of the fragment and then you then merge those ends of the fragment and it gives you sort of double the amount of information and so when you have repetitive sequences you know that read one read two come from the same fragment 
So even if read one, read one, read one is the same from all these different fragments, they may not share the same read two. And so it's a way of starting to resolve uh, where these fragments come from, as opposed to a single read in which you, they all start at the same location. And so it's going to be unlikely that you can take the repetitive sequences and distribute them correctly throughout the genome. Right, so here's an example of the paired end read. So the fragment is right up here, and this the adapter part that's just an important thing to remember that you're pulling it from your genome library. And so, the, the, the DNA that you want that fragment, you're going to link it to some adapters that are going to make it possible to put it into the plasmid in the first place. And so, then when you grab the plasmids, you're always going to have these adapter sequences also. So you're always going to sequence those, and so you have to remove that from your, your read. But at any rate, so this is the idea of a single end read, SE read, right? You, you're going to read in one direction, and you're going to get a, par, uh, you know, a 50 base pair read, and that's it, okay? But as you do a, a paired end read, that means you get one end and then you get the opposite end and even though there's a whole bunch of sequence that you don't get you have some sense of you're going to create fragments that are likely to collectively give you enough information to fill the gap okay so again if the genome is sort of unstructured, just lots and lots of sequence, this isn't really a big deal. So I tried to, I, I found this nice tutorial site, homealong.us, that has, you know, some pretty good information about sequencing and whatnot. So I recommend you take a peek at it. So I borrowed heavily from their site because I liked the way they presented it. And so, again, I'm just warning you that, that this assembly stuff is going to run into physical limits in terms of how much of the assembly you can do from scratch without landmarks. All right, so imagine this is our genome, and we have these different colored areas to indicate, you know, just chunks of DNA, right? And so clearly what I'm trying to show here is that the red is, in effect, a repetitive DNA sequence. So if you have your sequences from read one and read two, so that's a paired end read. The idea then is that you'll be able to assemble, but because of the limits of the fragment lengths in terms of your, re you're going to miss this chunk of repetitive sequence, and so you're going to end up assembling it and ignoring, in effect, the repetitive sequence. So clearly that's a problem, right? So that's kind of setting up, again, why the repetitive DNA sequence don't work so well for us. So the early algorithms that people use, so that the, the Ventners of the world used, um, were really clever programs working under some severe time constraints and whatnot. And so the approach is basically called overlap layout consensus. So you look for overlap, you, you combine the, the fragments into contigs and looking for the maximum amount of consensus. So these are some of the, the programs that were used to generate um, a good f portion of the human genome sequence reads, okay? So the problem is it's really s hard to tell the difference between error and um, actual, you know, real DNA elements coming from different parts of the genome. So what you would use is you have a little bit of overlap, but it's not perfect, right? So maybe the one or two bases differ in the overlap between the two fragments. And so you're gonna, one of the sources could be just simply that's a base calling error. So you'll look at what the FRED scores, and if they're low, then you would think that, well, those nucleotides were read correctly by the sequencer, and so it's unlikely that they're just sort of errors, and so you go, they're probably coming from different regions of the genome. But obviously this is kind of an arbitrary cutoff point, all right? So, but you would, it's not that they weren't aware of these problems, and so they developed statistical approaches trying to help them when they were doing the assignment of overlapping sequences with a little bit of variation. Is that base, is that error, or is that actual biology error, okay? But as um, you start 
building up your your sequence you're going to run into large chunks of DNA that just simply you can't tell the difference between error the variation is error or the variation is due to biology the DNA elements come from different areas of the genome so enter uh, graph theory all right and so I'm not going to be able to do a whole lot of justice to this but you should now in your growing vocabulary and genetics you should know about De Bruin based graph programs that use uh, sequences and you start lengthening them by using uh, some properties of graph theory and so this is called a directed graph and what you do basically is you sequence your fragments from your library and then you with your computer you basically chop them up into even smaller reads and so these are called kmers so you might decide we're going to grab from these sequences even though they're like 50 base pairs long we're going to grab uh, seven nucleotides at a time and then we will use those to sort of connect them one at a time from where they come from and the result will be this very complicated series of links between the nodes which are your little seven oligotide reads from the larger reads okay and the nodes then are connected by an arrow running in direction and so from this you can start putting together a picture of what the genome looks like so this is an example of, uh, of what the homolog us is using as a sort of a tutorial thing so the original sequence looks like this and so we say we're going to look at just uh, a window of sequence information that is just seven base long so that's a seven mer okay and then the algorithm is basically you take seven minus one and you sort of that's the way you're going to shift one base at a time so each one's a seven mer window but you're stepping through kind of one base at a time and so you end up generating this overlapping sequence right connected 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 and that's how you build your fragment okay so just describing the algorithm and these are what are called de Bruin graphs okay so at least in principle then while it's not going to give you a perfect mapping of the genome if you have repetitive sequences so there's my green and green now these are showing repetitive sequences so when we take our seven mer approach we'll start taking overlapping sequences here 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 and here 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 all the way through but this blue region are is which is separated by two repeats okay it's going to form a unidirection back here okay so we won't be able to kind of represent the genome perfectly but we have a sense that there's uh, we have now more information about the repeats than we did before crystal clear I'm sure <laughs> okay so what's the take-home message from this when you have uh, repetitive sequences a simple overlap sequence assembly is not going to give you uh, a good build and so there are other algorithms that employ directed graph theory and they're called de Bruin graphs and so those help build the genome even in the face of repetitive DNA sequences okay so we're gonna go ahead and stop there the future is what well uh, the future is well I, I make the story about so my, my textbook in genetics when I was your age so that, that's a long time ago um, was is just as thick as your book right but if you kind of look at the information it's not that it was wrong but of course lacked technology back in the, the early 80s compared to today and some of the questions that we asked back then you know have been resolved now right and so uh, but your textbooks no thicker than my textbook and so the churn of information a lot of what I learned way back when is no longer relevant today and so my prediction for you in terms of this genome sequencing story is that um, a lot of the algorithms are only going to be of interest in the historical sense because 
new technology is going to increase the ability of reading sequences longer and longer and longer continuous reads and so remember the 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 holy grail here is that we should be able to one day start at the beginning of a chromosome and then just seek walk our way through the entire length of the, the chromosome base pair by base pair by base pair and read it so once you do that there's no need for all this assembly stuff so I like the math. I think the computer stories are really, really interesting, but the probative value of going over all of the details of the algorithms now means that you're <laughs> kind of wasting your time, unless you're going to be employed in the sequencing industry, right? In which case you need a job, so of course you're going to want to become that kind of a data scientist because there are really good jobs in the sequencing industry and they require you some knowledge about algorithms and of course adapting new algorithms to improve sequence reads based on the technology, the read links that we have. Okay, so we're going to stop there and we'll see you on Monday.